What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled, as always, by Nerd Tees, and welcome to week three of my weekly CFL pick show for the 2018 CFL season. It's a football show. It's a hockey mug. I'm a complicated man. Week two in the CFL was not too bad. I think, on average, in general, we'll take this. We always want to strive for more, but we'll take it in general. Uh, I took my first straight-up losses of the season, so Tier, the dream of the undefeated season, is dead. Uh, two and two in week two straight up. That has a six and two straight up on the season. Was also two and two against the spread. That keeps us at an even four and four. But for our second straight week, we went three and one on the over-unders. That has us six and two over under for the year. I'm going to start opening these episodes by letting you know what the standings are in the CFL, but I'm not going to start that until next week because after this week, every team will have played at least two games. This week, however, four games on tap for week three. We've got the Ottawa Red Blacks hitting the road to Calgary to take on the Stampeders. We've got Winnipeg hitting the road to go into Hamilton to take on the Ticats. BC travels to Edmonton to take on the Eskimos and the Montreal Alouettes, the winless Montreal Alouettes, going to Saskatchewan to face the Rough Riders. But in two of those games from last week, and it's going to impact one of the games this week, we have some quarterbacks go down. But let's kick things off in Calgary. Again, Red Blacks come into town. Red Blacks beat the Rough Riders last week and a bunch of big time debuts because once again it was week two, but it was Ottawa's season debut because they had the bye week in week one. Some huge season debuts for some offensive players here for the Red Blacks. Trevor Harris at quarterback, 72%, threw for 345 yards, found the end zone twice. And at running back, William Powell touched the ball 21 times, put up 118 yards, and also found the end zone twice. Ottawa played a great top-to-bottom, full, complete game against the Rough Riders last week. They were smart with the ball, and they were smart without it. A 4-1 to turnover ratio. They forced four turnovers. They only turned the ball over once themselves. Also, a 4-10 to penalty ratio. Ottawa, disciplined, only took four penalties in that game. And a 3 nothing sack ratio. Three sacks for the Red Blacks. None allowed. And look, it is much easier to win in this league when your quarterback is not under pressure, not getting knocked down. I mean, look, just in football in general, you got to protect your quarterback. As displayed by the 72% statistic and 345 yards, Trevor Harris did a pretty good job distributing the football in this game. Ottawa had three receivers who had at least five catches and at least 70 yards. And to give some love to the defensive side of the game as well, defensive lineman Avery Ellis really shown for the Red Blacks on defense last week. Three tackles, two sacks, and he also forced a fumble. So once again, complete top-to-bottom game for Ottawa. Great way for them to kick off their season. Calgary, if you'll remember, they won in week one, but I didn't particularly think that they looked great. Bo Levi Mitchell in particular, a 41-7 win in week two over Toronto. Again, the aforementioned game where Ricky Ray got knocked out. So this is actually a matchup now that I look at it. I didn't put this together. Literally a revelation right now. A matchup between the two teams that caused quarterback injuries last week. And Bo Levi Mitchell, who I mentioned at quarterback, definitely bounced back in that game. 20 of 22. That's 91%, folks. You can't do it much better than that. 324 yards, found the end zone three times. Of those 324 yards, 131 of them went to wide receiver Eric Rogers. Five catches, buck 31. He scored two of the three touchdowns for Bo Levi Mitchell and Don Jackson second week in a row that we're mentioning running back Don Jackson really fighting to take that number one role in Calgary nine carries so I mean his carry numbers total number of carries definitely went down but he generated those nine carries into 123 yards that included a huge 70 yard rumble midway through the third quarter that really was one of the plays that I think iced that game now I mean look the score was what it was 41 to 7 but man when a running back in the CFL goes 70 yards in that direction that's so demoralizing for a defense not to be outdone Terry Williams the other name in this backfield for Calgary Calgary one of the few teams in the league really getting it done on the running side of the ball 
He rushed the ball 12 times. He put up 70 yards. Calgary also had four receivers that each had at least four catches. Rene Paradis, perfect in the kicking game. And on the defensive line, you had Derek Wigan and you had Siante Evans, who was in the secondary. Each of those two players forced a fumble. So playmakers on both sides of the ball. It's excellent to watch as a fan. And you got a game here between two teams that played two incredibly complete football games last week. That's going to be a fun one. Unfortunately, fun games are also sometimes difficult to pick. So you're looking at Calgary and Ottawa. I still got to give the edge, I think, to the Stampeders here. They're at home. They've played two games. Ottawa's only had that one game, and it was sort of against, you know, I don't want to say inferior competition because it wasn't. It was Saskatchewan. I think Saskatchewan's going to have a really, really good season, or I did, certainly, before the Zach Kalaros injury. So it wasn't really inferior competition, but it was only one game. Ottawa was at home. Season opener really juiced up for it. Now you got to go into the stretch of the season. So I'm going to give the edge here to Calgary, mostly based on the fact that they're at home. So I like the Stampeders to win this game, but... They're favored in this game by seven and a half points, and that is way too many against a team that played an incredible football game less than a week ago. So we're going to go Ottawa plus seven and a half in that game, but I do like Calgary to win it in a game that stays under 57 points. Let's go to Steeltown, baby. The Hammer, Hamilton, Ontario, where the Ticats will play host to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, both of these teams sitting at one and one. And both of these teams coming off of wins last week. We'll start with Winnipeg, a huge 56 to 10 win over my Montreal Alouettes. And it's just embarrassing at this point to watch Alouettes football because the whole team is just in disarray. But we'll talk about the Alouettes when we get there. Winnipeg, 56 to 10 win. And here's a reflection of just how dominant that win was. At halftime, the game was 34 to 7. And Montreal had only generated 95 yards of offense. Chris Strevler at quarterback for the Blue Bombers had a monster game last week. Four total touchdowns, three of them through the air. He found the end zone on the ground as well. Threw for nearly 79%, put up 246, and added 98 yards on 10 carries. Now look, if you're a defense in the CFL and you allow the opposing quarterback... 98 yards rushing. He was the best rusher for Winnipeg all night. Get your stuff fixed. Anyway, and it turns out even wide receivers can throw touchdown passes on Montreal. Wide receiver Darvin Adams, who if that name is at all familiar to you, Darvin Adams had a cup of coffee in the NFL with Carolina. He threw a 26-yard touchdown pass to running back Andrew Harris. It was Winnipeg's first touchdown of the game, and that just got them rolling, rolling, rolling. And uh, yeah, very complete game on defense from the Blue Bombers as well. In the secondary, Anthony Gator, five total tackles. He had a sack. He also had an interception. And up on the defensive line, again, line play in football, obviously so important. Defensive lineman Tristan Ocpolago, I think it's Ocpolago, four tackles, two sacks on the game. He had himself a bit of a football game. Winnipeg also dominating time of possession in that game. Possessed the ball for over 38 minutes. Not to be outdone, Hamilton showed up, man, against Edmonton. I believe that game was in Edmonton. A 38-21 to win over the Eskimos, which is obviously nothing to shake a stick at. Jeremiah Masoli at quarterback. Now back-to-back 300-yard games for Masoli, and I know that's just going to make Chris Carter be like, eh. I have to keep mentioning Chris Carter because he... Again, part of the only reason he's gotten into watching the CFL this year is to watch Johnny Manziel. And he's not going to see much Johnny Manziel if Jeremiah Masoli keeps putting up 300-yard games. Through just under 66%, which to me is perfectly fine. Three touchdowns. Now, he did throw an interception, so Chris, you can be happy about that. But he added 59 yards on the ground with seven carries. Hashtag breakout alert. Running back Mercer Timmons had the game of his professional career last week. Before I tell you this game, here's Mercer Timmons' career numbers prior to the game last week. 19 games, 19 touches, so about a touch a game, for 81 yards. All right? 17 carries, 133 yards, and two touchdowns. His first two touchdowns as a pro in the CFL. Hamilton, if you remember from the week one game, had two different receivers go for 100 yards or more. 
In this game, they had two different receivers go for 100 yards or more. And it was two different receivers from the receivers that did it in week one. So they've had four 100-yard receivers already this season. Brandon Banks, six catches for a buck 17 and a score, as well as Luke Tasker caught the ball five times, turned it into 103 yards. He found the end zone twice. Again, to shine some light, give some love to the defense, linebacker Harry Dean starring on defense for the Tiger Cats. Eight total tackles, I believe one of them came on special teams. He also had a recovered fumble. Hamilton also possessed the ball for 35 minutes, just a little bit over 35 minutes, and I mentioned it last week. Time of possession, I think, probably is a bit of an overrated stat, but man, if you can possess the ball for 35 minutes, you got a great chance of winning a football game. Hamilton comes into this game as a four-point favorite at home against Winnipeg. Total in this game is set at 56. Now, I realize that Winnipeg's numbers are tilted because they played Montreal. And I realize that Hamilton had a very good showing, good offensive showing last week. But it was against an Eskimos team that defensively, they're actually struggling quite a bit. They are up there among the worst scoring defenses in the CFL right now. So you got to realize that the numbers here are stilted in one particular direction or the other. I look from top to bottom and I think, which one of these teams do I legitimately think is a better football team? And for me, even though the game's in Hamilton, I just feel like Winnipeg's the better team. I'm going to give the edge to Winnipeg here on the road. I'm going to take the Blue Bombers in Hamilton to beat the Ticats. So obviously I love Winnipeg plus four against the spread because I like them to win the game outright. And this is a game that I actually think does go over the 56 points. It's two offenses that are showing that they are very capable right now. Two quarterbacks playing really well. So I'm actually going to take the over in this one. Game goes over 56 points. Winnipeg wins it straight up. And I love them plus four on the line. Before we move on to games three and four, obviously I will take the opportunity to pump Nerd T's tires. Today's blend is chocolate cake. It's the man, the myth, the legend. It's the great one. It's the Wayne Gretzky of Nerd T's. It's chocolate cake. Look, you make yourself a cup of chocolate cake or really any of the great chocolate blends that Nerd T's has on their website, your kitchen smells like a bakery. Like it's incredible. And it's a cup of tea. NerdTees.ca promo code BWFINEST. It's going to save you 15% at checkout. You're going to get free shipping on any order in Canada that's over 50 bucks. If you're in the United States watching this, first of all, thank you. Second of all, you're going to get a great conversion on the U.S. dollar because all the prices on the website are in Canadian. The shipping is really affordable to the U.S. There's never been a better time to try yourself out some nerd teas or get some nerd teas for somebody you love. Why not? Let's go back to Edmonton now where the Eskimos are going to be playing host to the BC Lions. BC coming off that 22-10 to win over Montreal in week one. They obviously were on the bye from last week. In that game, their quarterback Jonathan Jennings much maligned heading into the season. I even said it like he's got to protect the football. He did that pretty well against Montreal. Granted, it's against Montreal. 20 of 24 for 83% throwing. That's, look, I mean, that's a fantastic game any way you slice it. He only put up 183 yards, so maybe there's some arm questions. He did find the end zone twice, did not throw an interception. Very important for the player that had the most interceptions in the league last year. Also added 57 yards rushing on nine carries. He was actually BC's most effective running back. I say that, at least on the offense. Running back Chris Rainey on special teams had himself a heck of a game in the return game. Seven total returns between quick kickoffs and quick kickoffs and punts. Seven total returns. Put up 134 yards. That's almost... You know, it's like 19 yards a return. On defense, obviously very familiar name, controlled that game. Solomon Elamimian, who I mentioned in the week one video, he had seven tackles. And on the defensive line, Devon Coleman, seven tackles. He also had five different players on the BC defense record a sack. It wasn't all sunshine and rainbows for BC in that game. Look, I'll, I'll be honest with you. In that game, they lost time of possession, which again, we can say what we can. They lost time of possession. They really lost the battle on all downs. Montreal was more effective in that game on basically first down, second down, and third down. They took six penalties on defense. 
but they won the game with opportunistic football. That was a winnable game for Montreal, and now you play a game that you won, but knew that you didn't play nearly as well as you could have. Then you hit your bye week. Now you got to go into Edmonton and play the Eskimos. Hmm. Speaking of the Eskimos, obviously they're going to come off that 38 to 21 loss to Hamilton. Well, it was a bit of a slow night by comparison for Mike Riley. He only went 20 of 30. That's, look, that's 67%. I shouldn't say only, but that was only 30 attempted passes, which is a actually relatively low number for somebody like Mike Riley. 286 yards, only found the end zone twice, and he did throw an interception, uncharacteristic interception for Mike Riley. Now, he did add a rushing touchdown, so I guess he kind of made up for the interception that he threw. Again, once again, Mike Riley with a rushing touchdown. C.J. Gable, recognizable name in the league at running back. Second straight quiet night for him. Just 12 touches for 50 yards. And through two games, he's only touched the ball 26 times, only 13 touches a game. And it's 93 yards. Like, that's that's low. That's a low number for C.J. Gable, a player that has been dynamite and really good in this league for a number of years. You gotta wonder if he's kind of slowing down. His long play this season is only 16 yards. He hasn't found the end zone. We're talking about a 30-year-old running back here, and that's kind of where a lot of running backs hit the wall. Once again, Mike Riley delivers a long bomb, beautiful pass for a touchdown. This was to wide receiver, and I apologize ahead of time if I mispronounce your name, Dakeel Williams, an 88-yard touchdown catch from Mike Riley, like early in the first quarter. This game was looking like it was going to be a shootout, but that's another pass that traveled 40-plus yards in the air. Mike Riley's got himself a gun. I personally have got to start questioning, however, Edmonton's run game as a team just 14 rushes for 62 yards. They did have Mike Riley's touchdown, but again, that was a short yardage touchdown. It's not an effective run game. And I kind of maybe diminished the run game in the CFL a little bit too much. You've still got to be able to move the ball. Certainly on first down, you've got to be able to move the ball. And Edmonton's not really showing that to me right now. That's only, what, a little over four yards a carry. Edmonton comes into this game as a six and a half point favorite at home, the total in the game being set at 54. It's indisputable to me that Edmonton's ineffective play from last week is the primary reason why they're only six and a half point favorites in this game. BC as a team is not that good. Edmonton's going to be looking to rebound from not only a loss at home, but a game that I think they have to feel that they probably should have won or should have been a lot closer. I expect Edmonton to have a dynamite performance in this football game. I'm going to take the Eskimos at home all day to beat the BC Lions. I like Edmonton straight up. I like Edmonton minus six and a half on the line. You're going to give me the Eskimos by less than a touchdown. Thank you very much. I will take that. In a game that I actually think stays under the 54 points because I want to see what BC's offense does as a sequel. They only put up the 22 points on Montreal. And the last game on the schedule for this week is the aforementioned Montreal Alouettes traveling to Saskatchewan to take on the Rough Riders. So we'll start with Montreal. Obviously 56 to 10 loss against Winnipeg. They've only scored 20 points in two games. This is a team that is not good. Again, this is despite the best efforts of quarterback Drew Willie. He did what he could in the game. 16 of 25 at 64%. That's perfectly fine. But he only threw for 111 yards, which either means, again, his receivers are not getting open downfield or they're not doing much after the catch. He did throw a touchdown, didn't throw an interception. That's good. But he failed to keep drives moving. And that's the big problem. The Alouettes did have five receivers that had at least three catches on the game, but none of them garnered more than 35 yards receiving. B.J. Cunningham was the recipient of Drew Willie's one touchdown pass. If you remember from last week, Tyrell Sutton, we talked about him from the Montreal BC game. He had himself a pretty good game in week one. Kind of came a little bit down to earth there in week two. Went from 20 touches in total in the receiving game and the run game in week one to just seven touches in week two. But his yardage number only went down from 96 to 81. So seven touches, 81 total yards. This is the guy on offense that you need to focus on. This needs to be your Andrew Harris type. Some notable performances on defense from week two. Linebacker Hanak Muamba. 
And that's probably, again, a bad mispronunciation, and I apologize if that's the case. Had a Herculean 11 tackles on defense, and that's because Winnipeg had the ball the whole game, basically, but 11 tackles on defense, that's a monster performance right there. And linebacker Chip Cox did chip in, pun intended, with a forced fumble. Rough Riders going home after that 40-17 to loss in Ottawa to the Red Blacks in Ottawa's season opener. They never really just never got out of the blocks in that game. Right from the beginning of the game, they just really never got into their groove. They only had a total of 345 yards on offense. That's not quite enough. They turned the ball over four times. That's really not enough. And like I mentioned earlier in the episode, the Zach Kalaros injury. Brandon Bridge came into the game in relief, went 13 of 22. That's just a little bit under 60%. I'd like to see that percentage come up a little bit, but again, he certainly didn't expect that he was going to be playing. 13 of 22, 145 yards. He did not find the end zone. He threw an interception. He did add 27 yards on four carries. But if it's going to be Brandon Bridge going forward, Brandon Bridge is going to have to be better than that. That said, he was probably Saskatchewan's most effective runner in the entire game, despite the fact that he only carried the ball four times. Combined, Jerome Messam and Trey Mason, who was kind of the two-headed monster for Saskatchewan in the run game, combined, they carried the ball 14 times for 61 yards. It's about four yards a carry. They didn't find the end zone. In the CFL, your run game's got to be, if you're going to focus on the run game, it's got to be better than that. Saskatchewan still doing a pretty good job of spreading the ball out. They had receptions by seven different receivers in this game. And in the secondary, Duran Carter, who is actually a, a, a wide receiver, but is playing defensive back, who I think they should probably move back to wide receiver because now they're really going to need playmakers. Deron Carter had the only interception in the game. Aside from that, he was targeted a bunch of other times, gave up a touchdown. If this was against any other team in the CFL, I might actually contemplate taking an upset here on the road, but it's Montreal. They've shown me absolutely nothing this season. So let's go with Saskatchewan to get the win at home over Montreal. Saskatchewan favored in this game by 10 points. And I'm going to tell you to take them because, look... Montreal has scored, what, two touchdowns in two games? The total in the game is only 45 and a half. It is by nine and a half points, the lowest total in the CFL this week. And I'm still going to tell you to stay under because this could very easily be like a 22 to 10 game, like that BC game from week one. All right, folks, those are your week three games in the Canadian Football League. We'll go over our picks here with you one more time. Calgary and Ottawa. I like Calgary at home to beat the Red Blacks. But I do like Ottawa plus 7.5 on the line. That's too many points in a game that stays under 57 points. I like the Winnipeg Blue Bombers on the road. My only road team to win this week. Go into Hamilton, beat the Tiger Cats. So I love Winnipeg plus 4 on the line. I like them to win the game outright in a game that goes over 56 points. In Edmonton, I like the Eskimos at home to beat the BC Lions. I like Edmonton to cover minus 6.5 in a game that stays under 54 points. And the final game, Saskatchewan at home to beat Montreal. Montreal showed me absolutely nothing that would make me think they're going to win a football game yet. So Saskatchewan at home over Montreal. I'm going to take Saskatchewan to cover that minus 10 because you don't know what you're going to get on offense from Montreal. And since we don't really know what we're going to get on offense from either side, I like the game to stay under 45 and a half points. All right, folks, that's going to do it for me, Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled, as always, by Nerd Tees. The week three episode of the CFL Pick Show is in the books. I got to get run into work. Enjoy the games in week three. What did you think of the games in week two? What did you think of the quarterback injuries? Anything like that? What do you think of my hat? My hat was a popular topic in the comments section last week. Let me know all that stuff in the comments. Enjoy the week three games. We'll see you again for week cuatro.